clap. Hey, thank you. Okay, it's lightning talks time. Uh, you know the deal, five minutes of talk. Uh, when we get to the last 10 or so seconds, finger claps, can we practice? And then as the time goes down to the last two or three seconds, we turn it into hand applause, proper claps, and then an outrageous noise, completely uproarious. As we welcome to the stage, Tom Eastman. Yeah? Shit. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Give me my, give me my stuff. Aha. Okay. I, I've got five minutes to try to convince you that these little lumps of hexadecimal are actually secretly incredibly fascinating. Um, you've all probably seen UUIDs before. You may or may not use them a lot. You probably just use one version. You're probably wondering why there's five versions of UUIDs. You're probably wondering why, even though there's five versions, every company invents their own thing, and why we're making even more versions. So. This is a whole bunch of UUID version ones. This is the original design. They're supposed to sort of be a unique identifier that lasts forever and is never going to collide with anything else. About half of it is a timestamp, and about half of it is a node ID. And the node ID is like the MAC address of your computer. Um, and they decided to put the timestamp in like little Indian order so that these things would not like uh, grow down the bottom. They wouldn't get bigger over time. Um, this is kind of what the schematic of them looks like. So there's like a, about half of it is the time and about half of it is the node ID. Um, they've been building them like this since the 1990s. Um, UUID 4 is, the probably, is probably the one that you see used a lot these days. It's the one that's entirely random. It didn't bother with the timestamp and it didn't bother with um, the node ID. Uh, and so that's what these ones look like. Or these, these are those ones. So they're just completely random. Um, very unguessable, very sort of cryptographically secure, quite u often used as like um, session IDs and tokens like that. Um, they still make pretty good primary keys for your database, but they start falling over for reasons why, which we'll get into. Um, there's a couple other versions. So um, UUID 5 is a weird one that you can use for creating, taking anything you've already got and turning it into a UUID. So I create my own little namespace, and in that namespace, the string 1 becomes this UUID, and the string 2 becomes this UUID. Um, that can be really useful if you have like a UUID-shaped hole and you need to put your own kind of primary key or identifier into it. And there's like well-defined namespaces for like DNS or X509 certificates, whatever the hell those are. Um, so, in Python, there's five versions. Version 1 is the one I just showed you. Version 2 doesn't exist. Don't use it. It's a weird Microsoft thing. Version 3 is a bad version of version 5. Version 4 is the random one that you probably see everywhere. Version 5 is the one I just showed you. Why do these, why do, why do these disappoint people? Why, um, whenever you get to a big company, why did all of these guys, you know, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Twitter like three times actually, uh, MongoDB, all of these people kind of invented their own versions of unique identifiers. Uh, all of them looked at UUIDs and decided they just weren't any use. And the reason for that is once, you, once you're talking about it at a big scale, Databases don't really like primary keys that uh, aren't sortable. People actually want to be able to generate UIDs that don't collide, but they want them to sort of appear next to each other if they were generated roughly the same time. Um, there was a few other weird decisions made, like in UUID 1, uh, they used the Gregorian epoch, which is a bit annoying to calculate compared to a Unix timestamp. People like Unix timestamps a lot more better. Um, you have to parse the time sequence weirdly if you want to. Um, and using the node ID was decided to be a bad idea because you were exposing the MAC address of whatever generated the UIDs. So the number one reason was everyone kind of abandoned these things because we wanted number to go up. We have um, the IATC or crypto bros in a way. So they're inventing new ones, and the new ones modeled after um, all of those things that I just showed you, all of those, pretty much all of those alternative implementations basically had the common thread that they all went up over time. They were all just orderable. So the first new version, UUID v6, uh, is exactly the same as UUID 1, but all the fields are kind of reorganized. Um, they're just reshuffled so that you actually have the big end of the time at the start, kind of like, you know, year, month, day, instead of, like, seriously, it was kind of like almost American style. It's like year, day, month, or some shit like that. I don't know. Um, and then UUID v7 is actually incredibly simple to implement and um, 
is the, stan the, the standard that will probably be the one everyone expects you to use going forward, where the first half of it is like the Unix timestamp in milliseconds with some sub-millisecond precision down to like 4,000 uh, nanoseconds on the Python implementation. And then the rest of it is just random data. And there's a couple things in there. Um, UUI DB7 is pretty cool, and it's fun to play with, and it was fun to implement, and you should probably use it in database keys going forward. Um, and then finally, they invented UUI DB8, which is just screw it, do it yourself. Um, <laughs> you can put your own version specifier in there, and then you can fill it up with whatever information is useful for your application. So long story short, if you want good primary keys, you use the new UUI DB7. If you want utterly unguessable ones, you use UUI D4. If you're doing weird stuff, you might want UUI D5. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tom. Tom was uh, betting to me that he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't uh, finish in time, so uh, thanks, Tom. Um, so up on deck, we have uh, Noah Kantrovitz, who I think has heard that. He's busy taking a microphone off someone. Uh, but first, Alex Ware and Eleanor Williams. Awesome. Uh, so we came up with this idea last night. The slides did not exist two hours ago. Let's do this. We are the uh, Canberra Python user organizers, uh, us and Andrew Hicks in the crowd, shout out, and also Jonah. Um, so how did this all start? So Perth Python user group, many years ago, uh, the girls from, a couple of girls from Europe were attaching of this event called Jenga Girls that invented to PyCon Europe EU. We went, we've got six weeks, can we do one in Brisbane? And we did. Um, uh, we went and did, uh, I went and did, a, lots of familiar faces there, by the way. Um, uh, did a bunch of them around the world. Uh, there has it's been a tremendously successful initiative, um, like literally tens of thousands of people, lots of events in, uh, the current president is from Zimbabwe, more events in Africa than in America. Um, and we're really proud to, they've got excellent resources, really proud to be part of it. But it is now 2023, I haven't organised that in a while because um, I had a family. Um, but uh, we wanted to do some research and uh, outreach initiatives um, and noticing that still like half the people here don't kind of look like us. So there's this organisation called 5050 at the ANU that we uh, decided to do some stuff with. Uh, yep, and then from that discussion, we came about of what we wanted to do next, and uh, there was... Yeah, I've, been, I've, I've organised a bunch of these. Why don't we... I haven't done one in ages. Let's organise one of these. In Canberra. And one of the lovely things about the application process for Django Girls was it was so fast that we had an event and, like, a website up and running before we'd actually thought through whether it was a good idea to plan one for eight weeks. Um, but at this point, it was real, so we were doing it. Um, luckily, Canberra has a bunch of incredible organisations that we were able to just, in a huge panic, email and ask for help and we got support, uh, involvement, promotion from all of these different people. If you are doing any kinds of grassroots organizing, definitely check who else in your community has already done stuff. And shout out to Linux Australia. If you aren't aware of the community grants program, we had an absolutely incredible experience. Cassie, they were we so, love you. so lovely in supporting us through the process of applying for money and they allowed us to pay for pizza on the day. Very important. Um, as well, uh, in organizing something like this, having a user group with a massive mailing list, very handy. Uh, one of the best experiences was when we sent out our big email to the mailing list going, please help. We promise there will be an event, hopefully. Uh, looking the next day at all of the different people who had signed up as mentors, especially the people we didn't necessarily expect. Once we had all those people signed up, we then had to pair them up into groups where we were looking at roughly a group of like three attendees to one mentor. Uh, so social engineering for good, we were trying to match people on any kind of similar interests. Uh, this experience greatly improved by being at a pub with beer and burgers as we were figuring out that problem. Uh, also, in terms of things you learn when organizing stuff, we forgot to tell people what the end time of the event was. Turns out event schedules, useful, who knew? Um, the other bit, we almost stayed on budget. <laughs> So the event was a huge success, like speaks for itself. Um, we had a really great day. We had like uh, 30 applicants, uh, nearly 30 applicants, many people in the room, many people are off the photo here who didn't want to be part of it. Um, we had a great time, thanks to everyone who sponsored us. But what are we doing next? Um, I'm a web guy, uh, Alex is a data person. Don't, we want to alternate between a web and a, a data and science sort of thing. So we want to do one in six months that's software carpentry. We've never run one of them. So if anyone here has done a software carpentry workshop, please, can you come talk to us? We want to know how to do it. Um, so We would love help. Yes. Secondly, um, Yep. Oh, so we created a meetup group. So if you're in around Canberra and you would like to be involved in one of these events in future, uh, we're really looking to just try and improve gender diversity in tech. Um, so while we do use women in the name, uh, we are 
are certainly not limiting to and we that in to any capacity. If you thought that there was um, a space for another thing in between like women in big data and all of those sorts of things and the Python user group, that there's just, you know, Safety in numbers, guys. Um, and also, I wanted to shout out PyLadiesCon. I actually have no idea what this is, but it looks really fun. And I just it hadn't been shouted out, so I'm doing that now. Um, and finally, uh, uh, so the Django Girls Adelaide is happening tomorrow. Uh, we're not directly involved, but we are highly supportive. We're super excited to see what is going on. Um, we believe that there will be some information through the Discord, um, but go look for Ro at the Kraken table. Uh, they are still looking for some mentors, so if this is the sort of thing you would like to help out with, especially if you've got web dev experience, but certainly not limited in any capacity. Uh, or if you're interested in knowing how these kind of, the dynamics of these kind of events work, because they're like really successful, we should be doing more outreach, you know, getting us all together. Um, um, so go check that out tomorrow if you're here for the sprints. And we've got like time to spare. <laughs> Amazing. You have a choice, Noah. Uh, you either present without video or uh, Benno does interpretive dance for the three minutes uh, while you take your laptop to get configured. Dance, 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 dance. Dance. Okay, uh, Anesh, wait, Anesha Sarkar, uh, if you can set, get set up on this side, you're on deck, and uh, I'll start the clock. Noah, cut in whenever you're ready. All right, I'm going to give this one last shot, and then we're just going to listen to my talk, uh, which will not be as interesting, but... Benno, fill in the time. Nope, doesn't like it. <laughs> Nope. All right. Noah. All right. Oh, thanks, Ben. Uh, so you can't see my slides, but uh, I'm going to talk about how to look at space. And I guess I'm just going to read out some of the URLs, and these will be posted onto Discord later. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so the first thing, uh, maybe I just turn my screen around? <laughs> Let's do that. All right. Yeah, well, it's mostly black. All right, uh, so things. So the first one, this is the NASA Eyes Orrery. Uh, this is a great way to see a 3D representation of everything that is currently in our solar system. Planets, missions, comets, all the 3D representations of everything. Um, it is at eyes.nasa.gov slash app slash orrery. I'm not going to read all of these URLs out because some of them do get long and weird. All right, the next thing, the NASA Deep Space Network. So this is an array of multiple tele uh, radio telescopes around the world, one of which is actually in Canberra, uh, that gives a full coverage view of all deep space space missions throughout the solar system, and there is a real-time view of everything it is connected to, including a fun thing, if you go down to the uh, extended view, um, you can see the real-time data rates. This was actually a couple days ago when it was talking to Juno outside Jupiter, and you cannot see, but if someone very close to uh, maybe could, it's getting 200 kilobits per second from Jupiter. The fact that I cannot get that from my mobile phone very frequently is a very sad thing. Uh, all right, but that's just sort of the general idea of space. What do we want to look at actual space? Um, a service called MAST. This is a database that contains information from most of our space telescopes. So James Webb, Hubble, Spitzer, um, Kepler, all in this service called MAST. Um, also, it has an API, astroquery.mast. So if you want to play with any of this data, you can use that. Next up, HelioViewer, helioviewer.org. This is a site that aggregates a lot of information about uh, solar observation satellites. The one that's currently most interesting and still active is the Solar Dynamics Observatory, um, but the old Stereo A spacecraft is still there, just most of its instruments are offline, but it still makes really pretty pictures. Uh, all right, the bomb. If you want to figure out what weather is happening in space, the bomb has a space weather prediction center, uh, forecast center. Um, this gives you information about incoming geomagical, uh, yeah, that's my company name, geomagnetic events. Um, and also a fun thing, it has an aurora prediction map. Uh, it's probably never going to get quite this far north, but if you happen to be in Tasmania and you want to see is there going to be an aurora visible, they've got a prediction for you. All right, next up, Mars. So the best way I know of to get Mars, video, uh, Mars pictures is from the NASA mission sites. Um, so these give you uh, these sort of process JPEGs. These are not science quality, but this is what Mars looked like about 12 hours ago. Um, this is from the, I believe, left nav cam on Perseverance, and this is from the right nav cam on Curiosity three days ago. 
If you want to get the real science quality images, there's a program called Mars Viewer. It is a really gnarly Java app, but it will give you the raw data if you know what you're looking for. If you want something that isn't, or, uh, isn't the Sun or Mars, the next up is the NASA PDS Image Atlas. So this gives you basically every other spacecraft that NASA is in charge of. Um, Fun ones include the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. They just have these giant track images. They're all PNGs, relatively easy to work with, that are just scans of the surface of Mars. Similarly, there's the Planetary Science Archive from the ESA. So this is for all spacecraft that the European Space Agency is in charge of, such as Bepi Colombo. And if you want to actually like look at things with your face, you'll need to know where they are. Uh, now, for big things like, say, Jupiter or stars or galaxies that don't move very often, uh, you can find those very easily online. But if you want to look at, say, a satellite, you need its orbital information. And the place you get that is a website called Celis Track. Uh, the story of this one's actually really funny. Uh, it originally started with a guy who was running a BBS in the early 90s, and he would call into the US military once a day and request military information, and they would just give it to him. And and eventually, this became so important that when the office that was giving the information was shut down, NORAD uh, just started sending him the data directly <laughs> because everyone was dependent on his website. Um, it also has a nice 3D viewer, so if you want to do that, you can see 3D positions of satellites. And also, it has a Python API in a library called Skyfield. Thank you very much. Well. Here in the Python world, we all like to think that space is significant. So uh, thank you, Noah, for giving us more space. Boo. Oh, we gave Libby a mic, did we? Yeah. Hi, Libby. Hello. The voice of Bob, Libby Berry, everyone. Uh, up on deck, we have Matthew Perry. But first, a first-time speaker, Anisha Sarkar. PyCon, I made a thing. Um, my name is Anesha Sarkar, and I'm a very passionate student about natural language processing. But at this PyCon, I learned about multiple tools, especially about GUIs. So I decided to implement it, because there's no better way to test my understanding other than to do a practical project. So my, ever since I came to Australia, I was intrigued by the way pedestrian buttons worked and the very cool music that came along with it. <laughs> this formed the basis of my project to simulate the traffic signals using code. So how do the traffic lights work? We've got buttons, we've got timer, and we've got sound. When you press the button, if your luck is good, the green line turns on right away, and then you can cross. And when in that process, there's also sound, so, so that people can know, like people can just hear and know that the light's on. And now, can I simulate this on computer? Of course I can, at least a simple version. I decided to start this project during PyCon AU. <laughs> and end it at PyCon AU, because I know when I go back to university, I probably wouldn't have the time. My workflow, I would have the scope and prerequisites. Uh, then I would build a dual light system, which is a red light and a green light, add some timer, build the dual light system, sound, get some sound, test it and fix it, and also, most importantly, make the documentation. So the tools I used were tkinter, play sound to play the audio, a timer, and threading so that multiple processes could happen at the same time. Um, I'll show you the demo real soon, but I wanted to go through my slides real quickly. Um, in the future, I would like to implement, so during the sprint time, which I'll be here for, uh, have a mock implementation using the Adelaide Greenman proposal, uh, which I could probably link to it in the GitHub, uh, sorry, in the Discord. Um, and finally, I would also like to have some pedestrian lights turn green right away when the button is pressed. So I would also like to randomize the process a bit. Um, time for the demo. It's not too long, but. <laughs> I 
I'm so grateful uh, that I got to be here today at PyCon and learn so much through these talks. And I hope I'll be able to come to more, attend more PyCons, learn more, and just try out new things. Thank you, PyCon. <laughs>
Um, so the, the eventual results was the tests became about far, five times faster to execute. That's using eight cores. Um, getting rid of that database switching aspect might make it a lot faster. Um, we also have the capacity to scale it up with a 72-core machine. Uh, it's going to be easier to detect test isolation issues in the future if we uh, randomize the order in which they run more. And we don't have as much of a test budget anymore, which is really great. We can test more. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, so now I'm going to try and say PyTest XDist five times quickly. Or not. Um, Do it. Lachlan Jacob is up on deck, but first, uh, Tessa Bradbury with a, uh, with a war story. So, hello, everyone. So, I've been a web developer and an SRE for a decade, and about a year ago, I brought down production for the first time. Uh, Stop. There's a bunch of technical details in the public postmortem we wrote up, but behind every incident, there are humans. So, this is my story of what that was like. So I've had the power to break everything in so many ways for so many years, and I've seen so many incidents unfold, but this was the first time it's been me who clicked the button. And it was a surprisingly weird and complex thing to unpack. Like, I've been around reliability and resilient circles for long enough not to blame the person who triggered the outage, even when it was me. But it's always far more useful to explore why it happened, and not just the technical details, but the human and organizational sides. So, that day. It was a Monday. I get into work, and as always on a Monday, there's a bunch of stuff to catch up on from the weekend. And plus, I was involved with two incidents last week that I need to follow up. So I turn up, and my goal is to tick off as much as possible so I can get back to the real work. And one of my tasks was to check on a backfill that I'd been running that was tracking its progress in Redis. For those that don't know, Redis is an in-memory key-value data store. And the backfill had finished, but it had some weird errors right toward the end, complaining that Redis had run out of memory. But those errors had gone away, and it had got better. And so it had, given the backfill had finished, I figured the obvious thing was to just remove that tracking data because we didn't need it anymore. And I kind of need to do this before the end of the day because a lot of our customers are US-based, and so this is Monday, and they're all going to come online overnight, and I need to fix this before the load comes. So how do I remove this temporary data? Well, there's a command from Redis. It's called del. It deletes stuff. So I guess I'll log into prod, and I'll just run it. And like, if it doesn't work or it takes too long, it's going to time out, um, or I can just stop it, and it'll be fine. So I run my command, and it times out, but it's the client timing out, waiting for the server to finish the command, not actually the command timing out. And this is when the panic sets in. You know that fight, flight, freeze thing? Well, I was in full freeze mode. My brain literally stopped working. Um, but I managed to open a dashboard to see if there were errors, and everything was red. Um, <laughs> After the incident, I learned that that del command, uh, if you run it on a data structure, deletes each element one at a time and blocks all other requests from running while it's doing so. I was deleting a set with approximately 200 million entries in it. Um, so, but, so what did I do with this? Back at a previous employer, I did some SRE training, and they told a story. Someone had made some changes and broke something very important. And while the incident responders were digging around, the person that made the change stuck his head around the corner and said, I don't know if it's relevant, but I did this thing. Um, and the way they told the story, that guy was the hero. If he hadn't mentioned what he'd changed, it would have taken much longer to bring everything back. And this is why we don't cast blame. When people feel safe, they mention things they would never say otherwise. And that knowledge is a superpower. So I held on to that story with both hands, and I managed to post something in the incident response channel. It was not good, but I couldn't wait for the panic to chill enough to come up with the right words. I just had to post something and hope. And that moment is the moment I'm most proud of out of any incident I've been involved with. In retrospect, it wasn't a risk. But in that moment, when my brain was melting and I couldn't think through the consequences, I still chose to call out my mistake so we could fix things faster. And also, I'm very proud of the company that I work for where that was the right call to make, which is not true everywhere. So what do I do with this story? 
well, I could have just kept it to myself, but it's important. I held on to a story in that moment, and I wanted to be able to give that to other people. So I wrote this out, and this is basically a recap of an internal blog post that I made at the time. Um, and I made it, and everyone was nice and said lovely things, and it was great. Um, but the real punchline of the story was months later. It was someone else's turn to click the button and break everything. And they also chose to post in the incident response channel. And they referenced my post when they did it. And that is the power of our stories. Stories shape the culture of who we are together and who we choose to be. And we all have the power of our stories. And we all have the choice of when to speak those stories and when to listen. And so I invite you to be bold and to be vulnerable and to build the culture of who we want to be together. Thanks, Tessa. Had a, uh, a privileged position in the, uh, in the front of the room watching this wave of wince just uh, wash over the entirety of the audience here. Hi, Andrew. Uh, up on deck, we have Achinta. But first, uh, Lachlan Jacob, who's going to talk about something that may not have aged all that well. <laughs> <coughs> Hi, I'm LJ, um, and I'm today talking about the Bless You channel. So what is the Bless You channel? Um, we have a dedicated Slack channel at work for blessing colleagues when they sneeze. Um, it started in 2017. Um, it was a bit of a joke, you know, it's funnier to type someone's name into Slack than to actually use words to tell them bless you. Um, but, you know, due to things in 2020, it died off a little bit, despite probably more sneezes happening. Um, coming out of 2020, though, and as we started returning to the office, um, reports of Bless You's death were greatly exaggerated, and in 2022 of April, it received an uptick in usage as people came back. This uptick led to, ultimately, the creation of Sneezebot. <laughs> Sneezebot, um, since it's been added to our Slack, it's um, invoked a lot of fierce competition as people race to be the first to bless someone, and it's made coming back to the office a little bit more fun. Um, the way it works is pretty simple. Um, firstly, a sneeze occurs. Secondly, you tag the user in the channel as fast as you can. And third, to sort of verify that that sneeze did in fact occur, the user who was tagged has to react to the message. And importantly, only the first message counts. So we also added a command to Slack that would post a sneezer board of um, you know, how people are doing with their sneezing and blessing, um, which was pretty exciting. Um, and yeah, taking a little bit of a look under the hood, the way the Slack bot works, it listens for messages, it gets the text, finds the tag, in this case John, shout out to him, um, and adds the message to an unverified blesses map. Then on the flip side of that, when he reacts, um, we, look at the re we listen for reactions, and when they occur, if we find the message, we add points to the scoreboards and remove the message so that no one else can get points. Um, this caught on <laughs> to such an extent <laughs> that um, trophies were created and some special emojis for um, people who did well in the various um, sneezins. Um, the sneezins map to real world seasons, so we have a summer sneezin, an autumn sneezin, and so on. <laughs> um, one of the things we noticed once people started using the tool was that one of the most exciting things that can happen is if there's a close call, two people race to bless, and someone just misses out. And people tended to pile on a little bit and give them a letter L or indicating they lost. <laughs> Um, we wanted to encourage this sort of shaming, so um, <laughs> one of the enhancements was to add an elder board for if you lose. <laughs> it was even the case that people would delete, message to, delete messages to avoid the embarrassment. And uh, this is the elder board now. <laughs> um, there's lots of potential future ideas um, for what we can do with this. Um, we're really only just getting started, but um, there's uh, ideas of an analytics API to get some information, a sneeze graph so you can see who blesses who and maybe match that up with where people sit in the office, um, stats commands, achievements, and many more things. So there's plenty of exciting development still to come with Sneezebot. Um, and some quick stats. Um, we've so far detected 809 sneezes in the office, and 145 of those belong to one person. So 
good job to them, <laughs> we won't name them. <laughs> and all in all, a great deal of wasted office productivity. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, will that be available? Gesundheit, Gesundheit Lachlan. Uh, another first time speaker, indeed. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing a... Stop. I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing a proposal on that uh, in, next year's, uh, in next year's call for proposals. Will that project be available during the sprints? Asking for a friend, that friend is me. <laughs> uh, right, so up on deck we have uh, Jack Reichelt, but first, Achintha. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Achintha. I'm an undergraduate student from the Australian National University, and uh, I haven't done a speech since year 12 English, so if this sucks, I am so sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, machine learning. Everybody loves it. It helps us derive meaning out of massive amounts of data and make predictions based on patterns. Uh, most people have some interaction with it uh, on a daily basis without even realizing it. And machine learning now is progressing at an incredible rate with increasingly complex models, uh, all the way from your regression models and decision tree models uh, to think uh, deep neural networks, CNNs, and the list goes on. Uh, Despite the ever-ramping accuracy of these complex models and techniques, one of the most significant drawbacks is the lack of transparency behind model behavior. Uh, as these models get increasingly complex, uh, the nature of the model turns into somewhat of a black box. Uh, this is actually quite detrimental because w what it does is it starts to severely encumber their users in criti uh, critical decision-making applications. Uh, regardless of the accuracy of a model, if you can't explain why it came to a decision that it did, uh, that is not good. Uh, even conceptually, you're putting your faith sometimes blindly in something you don't understand, and, and that is problematic. Uh, you might be thinking, if the model is accurate and is doing what I ask it to, why should I care? Uh, well, as many of you would know, our machine learning models are, really are only as good as our data, uh, and making sure you have good data is, is bloody difficult. <laughs> and because, depend, uh, because depending on what you're looking at, uh, data can be filled with biases and inaccuracies. Uh, so making sure you have good data is not enough. Uh, you can imagine that when you take machine learning in the context of something like healthcare, it can be very difficult to ensure our models uh, are representing people of all backgrounds equally uh, when we don't understand why it is making the decision it did. So what you end up with are headlines like these and uh, even more marginalization of certain groups of people. And yes, these articles were not hard to find. I'm sure you guys have come across uh, topics like these too, and no, it is not just a data issue. Uh, as Doshi Vales and Kim have put it, the problem is that a single metric such as classification accuracy or even a collection of metrics is an incomplete description of mo uh, most real-world tasks. Uh, this is where the concept of interpretability comes in. Uh, as Christoph Molnar puts it, it's hard to mathematically define what interpretability is, uh, but intuitively it is the same as ex explainability, and we can kind of think of it as equipping these ML models uh, with the tools to display their machinations to us in a manner that our monkey human brains can understand. So it really is just placing a bit more emphasis on why as opposed to the how. Um, yeah, so as outlined by Du and colleagues in this great article, there's two classifications for the techniques that achieve interpretability, uh, and those are intrinsic interpretability and post hoc interpretability. Uh, as the name suggests, intrinsic interpretability involves having interpretability constraints constructed into the model structure itself. Uh, on the other hand, post hoc interpretability uh, techniques involve examining the model after the fact, uh, typically through creating a second model in parallel to explain the behaviors of your initial model. Uh, so both come with their own trade-offs, and it's typically between the performance of your model and exp explanation fidelity. Uh, so an intrinsically uh, an interpretable model may become more interpretable as you stack on these constraints, but then you tend to uh, get a decrease in model performance as you bottleneck the features used in prediction. Uh, in the post hoc case, it's really just an appro approximation of the model behavior, and so the fidelity, fidelity of the explanation we receive may not be as clear, but you retain the underlying model performance. Uh, so what are the res end results of this? Uh, a massive net uh, positive. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, for the user, they can have confidence and trust in these models, and this is in turn encourages further uptake. Uh, for developers, we get a better understanding of why things go wrong when they inevitably do, and that makes sure that there's less harm being put out by this thing we create. So I've just scratched the surface of these techniques, and these categories are actually broken down even further. 
uh, but I literally just finished writing this script and I have no idea how long I've got left. Uh, so I want to reiterate that we absolutely do not hate complexity. Uh, it is amazing, but my point is it's kind of like hopping in an Uber and, and your Uber driver goes, yeah, I'll take you home, but I want you to cover your eyes and ears the whole way and you'll probably end up on your front porch. Uh, this goes beyond just machine learning uh, side of things and it really relies on the expertise of many different sectors uh, <clears throat> from data analytics to social science to ethics and so on. Thank you. Thanks, Ochinta. Yet another first-time presenter. We, uh, we had three times as many uh, proposals as we had space for today, including more first-time presenters who pr than people who proposed anything at all yesterday. So uh, uh, yeah, thank you all for submitting Lightning Talks, especially all of our first-time proposers. Hopefully, we'll uh, see some of the ones that we couldn't take in this year uh, at next year's. Uh, Tangdo is up on this side, but first, Jack Reichelt, who is going to do a lot of things for the next five minutes. Yeah, so we're going to form a tech union. We're going for an any percent speed run world record attempt, glitchless, as in uh, I don't want to break the law. I don't really know if I'm going to. And yes, this is actually a real attempt. Yes, I'm actually starting a union. Yes, you can actually sign up. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to have our form where people can register their input. And so that's really good here, but this link is really... Put it on your screen. Is it not on my... No, it that's should be. There. That's um, how do I mirror real quick? Oh, Jesus. Um, uh, oh, this is Distance not good for my just, just drag it, just drag No, but then I can't see it. But, well, um, Sorry, yep, Buttons. yep, uh, yep. Arrange mirror. No. no. no sorry. Click there. World record yep. speed run attempt. Make a Mac. Oh mirror. boy, this isn't good. Um, okay, impossible. cool. So, um, we need a link. Uh, that's real long, that's really bad, so I'm going to stick this in the URL shorter so that you can all get that real nice and quick. Um, and we're going to go over here, and I'm going to skip that because I lost it. This will go in the Discord later um, so you can all see that. So here we have to write a whole bunch of rules. Um, these are the rules that a union needs, and so uh, I've written a bunch of them that should autofill and aren't. Oh, it's all gone terribly wrong. Okay, so. In that case, I'll slow down, and I'll talk about other things, and we're not going to do the speedrun world record. But um, I am actually going to start a union. I don't really know how. I have a friend of mine who has started a union for PhD students or something similar. I don't know exactly. Sorry, Jess. Um, but uh, as I, I've been saying we should have a union for years, and then I was kind of inspired by the talk yesterday, and I thought, well, if I've been saying it for years and nobody's done it, maybe that just means that I should do it. And so I'm going to do it. And, um, Stop. and so a couple of things with that is um, I don't know if Australian Software Union is the best name for it. Uh, I just thought a SU sounded fun. Um, so in this form here, uh, there's a thing of uh, what do you think the name of the union should be? Um, so fill that out, and we'll work that out. Um, in these rules, there's a whole bunch of stuff here, including really critically. Um, so property and funds, we don't have any. Um, it's, it's, it's just now. Um, alteration of rules. These are probably bad rules. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say that right now. These are definitely bad rules, because I wrote them starting at about lunchtime yesterday. Um, and so these will all be posted. They're good enough to get started, because they're better than nothing. But I made sure to make it so that it's not too hard to alter the rules. Um, the way that I got this list, by the way, is that the government said it. Uh, the government says that every, the rules for a union has to include these things, and so it includes these things. Um, there is also a form that needs to be filled out. I haven't filled it out because I didn't want to swipe across to this end. Dox myself. Um, it's, it's in my notes. Do not dox yourself. Also, don't dox other people. Uh, a critical thing. Um, we need 50 responses to have the union be made. Um, you can't submit to be a union unless you have 50 members, which seems kind of um, backwards to me. How do you get 50 members if you're not a union? Anyway, um, so that's why I've just called this an expression of interest form rather than a sign up to the union form. Um, oh, my other big point. I don't think that software is actually the best title for this because um, that feels like it kind of excludes a lot of people, and I didn't actually want that. Um, in the 
purpose and the who it's for and such, the eligibility for membership, it basically, I left it super open-ended, and it's, uh, do you now, have you ever, or do you intend to work as like a software developer or a UX designer or a data analyst or kind of anything in tech at all? Um, or are you a student of that? I guess that's in, you intend to. Um, because I think that they're all very related fields. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was the uh, Professionals Australia group. Um, I think that's really good, and they, they're very large, uh, and, and many of you may be signed up to them. Um, I think that's good, but I also think that tech is a kind of a different field in how we interact with it, how, we, how it evolves very quickly, and how policies need to be made about that. Um, you know, things around architects haven't changed as fast as things around technology do. So, I thought a specific union was good, rather than just encouraging people to join Professionals Australia. Um, that's why I'm doing this. I will post uh, this tiny URL. I don't normally trust those, because you never know what they're actually going to expand to, but you also saw me make it. Um, so I'm going to post that in the Discord after this. Um, please sign up, and um, I will, I'll, I'll keep doing this. I'll keep in touch with everybody who signs up. Thank you very much. I feel like this talk encapsulates all of the energy of lightning talks, which is just severe, chaotic, good energy, getting up on stage, everything going wrong, and flying by the city of pants to convey a brilliant message at the end. So thank you. Also, join your union. Yes. Hawk is on deck. And first, a talk about Go. Uh, good day, PyCon. Um, I was inspired by yesterday lightning round. I was so in inspired. Uh, and Ben was talk this morning, so I decided I'm gonna prepare something and get up here today, um, do my first lightning talk. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so AI became a hot, popular topic in recent years, and this is my story of my relationship with AI. Um, I started playing Go about like two years ago, so pretty new, noob. Um, it has since consumed most, if not all, my free time. I buy books, I study games, I get lessons, all of that to be bang on average. The peak of the curve, <laughs> as they say it, and I'm proud of it. The game itself is phenomenal. It's aesthetically pleasing. Um, every, every move feels like a conversation between me and my opponent. My moves usually say that I really want to win. Please make mistakes. Thank you. Um, but it wasn't just the game itself that kind of got me hooked. It was the documentary called AlphaGo. I'm sure some of you, even if you don't play the game, have heard of it, um, developed by the team at Google DeepMind. Um, AI opponents in games like this are new, um, but strong opponent like AlphaGo was just not a thing back then. The game of Go came from China uh, about 3,000 years ago, and it has always been regarded as the most challenging classical game for AI because of its um, complexity. Go is profoundly complex. There are an ast astonishing 10 to the power of 170 possible board configurations from the get-go. This makes the game of Go far more complex than the game of chess, 10 to the power of 40. I'll spare you the details, but long story short, it's used um, neural networks to evaluate and pick the best move, play them out, and give you the best one. Um, on the surface, um, this isn't anything new or mind-blowing, but in t 2016, this program defeated the Roger Federer, the Sam Kerr of the World of Go in a spectacular fashion. Uh, this event shocked the whole community. Many fear that AI is going to come along and sort of ruin the game. Um, however, in reality, it actually led us into the modern era of Go, uh, the AI era. It changed the game forever. Um, this is an AI move, AI would consider this move to be this or that. So these phrases sort of crop up in professional games a lot recently. There are countless books written about AI play style. People started to analyze games played by AI to find new creative ways to play this 3,000 years old um, board game, as if these AI program was like some legendary players back in the past to be admired. Um, so AlphaGo and other similar AI program have now become the most influential tool used in Go. It is absolutely fascinating to me 
that these programs learn how to play the game by training on a data set or data sets of existing human games. Then it played itself to get stronger. And then it became so strong that it is now teaching us how to play our own game. So we use tools like this one here to discover new, um, new strategies, new techniques um, to learn. I use it a lot um, to re review my games where I lost. As a teacher, it tells me the reason I lost is simply because I suck. <laughs> it, tells me because, uh, it tells me where my mistakes are. It tells me where, um, what the alternatives are. Um, by playing out X number of playouts, which is pretty cool, as you can see. Does that mean AI is a threat to all Go professionals or someone who teach? Absolutely not, right? The gap in strength between AI programs like AlphaGo and the average Joes like me is like vast. So I still need someone who understands the game better to study these AI games extensively and pass on the knowledge in their own ways. It's a tool, it's a powerful tool. Go players have been wielding it expertly in the last couple of years to further advance their field. And I would like to believe that so have we, since the tools like ChatGPT and all that came along. So Skynet, still fiction. Um, that's it for me, thank you. Thanks, Tang. Yet another first time speaker. Um, fantastic. Uh, Yakov is on deck. And now here's Hawkey with a talk about Go. <laughs> Hello. Um, I, I don't have any I don't have any analog fancy slides like Tom or space pictures or traffic lights or anything cool, but but I have a hat. Um, so that's how you know it's me. Um, you can find me on the internet in, in places. I've got the Dal avatar. Anyway, ding dong. Have you heard about moon ads? You Get on with it. You might have, but you, you've probably heard of, you know, Go, right? No, sorry. Go. Um, sorry, Elena, I stole your joke. Um, it's been a while since the whole we're rewriting all of our Python in Go thing has been current. It was a very uh, round in like 2013, 2014, that sort of thing. It's been a running uh, sort of theme. And that's, that's been forever. So I don't, I don't expect everyone to keep up to date with programming languages they might not use. So here's some things that have changed in Go since you probably haven't looked. Uh, Go modules. Now, the old way, where you had to have everything in a certain directory in a certain place, and you couldn't have multiple versions of that in different, different areas, uh, it sucked a lot. It was very bad. But there is new, uh, the new Goness, which is using uh, Go, Go modules. It's a lot closer to what you might open, uh, what you might expect when you start using a programming language instead of trash. Um, when you have a package, such as some, some code, and you've made a package, and you import something, you can then tell Go, hey, just uh, tidy up the Go mod, and it will look for the dependencies and work it out, and then make this nice uh, file that says what Go version it requires, what the module is, uh, what it requires directly, as well as what it requires indirectly. So it can work out the big old tree of dependencies and work out exactly what you need and the minimum version specification for it. The other big thing is generics. And this is something that I have been wanting for a very long time. And now it's uh, been since Go 118, which has been around for a little, a little while and has been some improvements in concurrent versions. We're up to Go 121, um, and I found that it's really helpful in even my own personal stuff, where I've been writing a, a thing where I've been making a RISC-V CPU interpreter because that's what I do with my Christmas holidays. Um, <laughs> so if you have a CPU that you want to be 16-bit or 32-bit, and but you want to work in terms of, let's say, your bit width, you can just make a, interface, a type interface, which is in 16 or uh, in 32. The squiggly line uh, means that it will accept t uh, things that have that as the base instead. So in Go, for example, uh, times are often uh, just an int 
that mean seconds in some sort of thing. So it sort of subclasses, but not subclasses because it's not classes because it's not objects, but it's, it's anyway. So when you're actually using this, it works similar to other programming languages. So you've got, you know, you define it in terms of this W is my register width type sort of thing, and I can define things inside my structs that are that type, and it will map, and everything works. And you just keep using that as you go, and you end up with the code being able to understand at uh, runtime basically what type it is without having to copy and paste for every different type that you want to accept, which is massively better. There's also a bunch more platforms. So AMD 64's finally optimizations, Windows and ARM 64. Uh, RISC-V has quite a few implementations and updates now. Uh, Long Arch, uh, WASI, they're for targeting WebAssembly. And a whole bunch of other small features that just make life nice, uh, like Min and Max in 2023. Uh, <laughs> profile guided optimization is also a, a big one that can be very good for things like Kubernetes that run uh, using Go. Uh, atomics for uh, atomic purposes, compressed debug symbols, all sorts of things. Uh, fuzzing, address sanitizers, all very nice to have. And it has gone a long way since you might have looked. So I recommend checking it out, seeing if your gripes with it in the past are still current. And if there are, keep complaining about them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Hawkey. I'm, uh, I'm excited to hear the next Go Talk at PyCon AU in uh, 2030. <laughs> On deck, Peter Hall. But first, a talk about somewhere to go with Yaakov. Uh, you're putting Go into everything, aren't you? Hello, everyone. Um, just as a preface, some different websites have some slightly different numbers and slightly different tales, but I put the story together as best I can. So, hello, friends. PyCon this year is my first time to Adelaide, and I've been using this time to research something I'd heard rumors and whispers about. So put your hands up if you like Jewish history. That's more than I expected. Put your hands up if you like nightclubs and bars. That's more of what I expected. So hopefully there's something in here for everyone. So in 1836, just 187 years ago, Adelaide was colonized by Europeans, and as with much of the history of Australia, there have been Jews there since the beginning. In 1844, though, there were just 25 Jews in the colony here in Adelaide, and as that number grew, they built the first synagogue here in Adelaide, and the community still kept growing. So this, I believe, is the original synagogue seen a number of years later. I don't actually know when this particular photo was taken. Uh, and originally, it was 35 feet by 25 feet, which is about 10 meters by 7.5, give or take. And it could fit 150 people, but that wasn't big enough, and it needed to be extended. By 1860, just 10 years later, the community had grown to 360 members, and by 1871, the community built a new, larger synagogue right next door. <laughs> the new one on the left was apparently built in Italian style, the old one in Egyptian style. I'm not an expert in this, I have no idea. This is what the internet said and according to some sources, had a capacity for 370 people, which doesn't sound like good capacity planning to me. 20 years later, in 1891, the community had grown to 1,840 people, and it was suggested that the synagogue should be redeveloped to provide an income for the community. So to do this, they developed five shops on Rundle Street, which I believe are still there as the Rundle buildings on the corner. But I didn't look too closely when I was there. But as part of this redevelopment in 1896, they moved the synagogue entrance around to the side street, and that side street bears the name Synagogue Place to this very day, which is quite confusing when you're researching coming to Adelaide, and you're like, oh, is there a synagogue? And Google gives you results for a street. <laughs> and so the streets there, along with some street art, there's some graffiti. And then in 1938, the buildings received a new Art Deco cement facade, which was probably this photo that I found, courtesy of Heritage of the City of Adelaide. You can see the Magen David, the Star of David, in a circle at the very top of the building, uh, above the balcony, and the words Beit Tefillah engraved on the balcony itself, which is Hebrew for House of Prayer. That's above the main entrance. And on the 11th of September in 1986, this building was granted heritage status and is listed as SA Heritage Place number 1345. But why is this relevant to most of you here? Well, in 1990, the community moved to a new facility in Glenside and sold the old, freshly heritage-listed building. And it became a nightclub known as the Synagogue, or Synagogue Nightclub. <laughs> or for some strange reason in 2000, Church Nightclub. Uh. I actually found this picture on a Facebook group back from when it was the church. <laughs> 
And you can see, like, this elevated forward central area, this is on the western side of the main hall, this would have been the Arna Kodesh, the ark in which the, the Torah scrolls are kept. And this is now, the, the, or at least when this photo was, isn't the DJ desk now. After that, it became the Apple Bar in about 2009, which was not a place where you go to get your computers fixed by geniuses, but another interior redevelopment of the same site. You can see in this photo again that elaborate front area, very pixelated because these are old photos, and there's also a mezzanine level in a ring above, which was likely the original women's gallery, a fairly common layout for synagogues like this. Since 2016, however, it is now the Mary's Poppin' Gay Bar, open three nights a week. <laughs> To be fair, it is a gay bar with a very friendly and curious security guard who was more than happy to answer some of my questions earlier this week. <laughs> but while the text above the entrance that once read House of Prayer is now completely gone, the original Star of David remains. It's obscured slightly by the paintwork, but if you know what you're looking for, the site still does have telltale signs of its origins as the Adelaide Synagogue. So if any of you are going to go hit up this queer bar after the con, please be at least a little respectful of its heritage. And just in general, I would suggest, try and keep in mind and appreciate the history and the value of whatever place you're in. Thank you. Thank you, Yaakov. Thank you. Hey, uh, on deck we have uh, Daisy and Lily. Uh, one talk to go. How many go puns can I, I no more. Uh, it's uh, Peter Hall. All right, thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. You have heard of this movie. <laughs> it's The Fast and the Furious. And you have heard that this movie has weirdly named sequels like Too Fast, Too Furious, The Fast and the Furious, Tokyo Drift, and so on and so forth for several movies. Would you like to know why? <laughs> this question will be answered. We need a history lesson about the uh, development of The Fast and the Furious. So. In 1998, Rob Cohen read an article in a magazine about an illegal street race in New York and thought, I should make a movie about street racing. What should we call that movie? He asked himself. Why not just use the title from the magazine article? We can make an amazing movie named Racer X. <laughs> and that became the working title for the movie. And they stayed with that title for quite a while. And they, but eventually they decided, no, this, this title is not punchy enough. We need to change it a bit. So what was the title of the race that happened in New York that's mentioned in that magazine article? It was called Drag Wars. They decided not to use that particular title, but it did inspire their next title. They went, Drag Wars, almost, Race Wars. <laughs> now, I feel like this title has some really obvious drawbacks. And so did they, so they eventually changed it again. They came up with a new title. So Race Wars, connotations of racial violence. The new title is Red Line, <laughs> which if you're familiar with the uh, history of the US real estate, also has racial problems. But eventually, Neil Moritz, the producer of The Fast and the Furious, saw a documentary about Roger Corman, the director of The Fast and the Furious, 1954. And he went, that, that is the title that I want for my movie. Shame it's already a movie, though. <laughs> Nonetheless, let's, um, so uh, just to, for context, the 1954 movie was described by Variety as a high-priced sports car bombs furnish most of the action and racing footage is interesting but becomes repetitious and helps to string out the running time to an unnecessary 73 minutes. <laughs> an unhandy length for supporting play dates. <laughs> Other reviews were similar. It wasn't a spectacular box office success, but they did manage to pay back their investors. So Neil Moritz gets on the phone to Universal and says, can we use this title? I want my movie to be called The Fast and the Furious. And Universal said, nothing at all. They just went silent. The phone line went silent. And eventually they said, look, we'll get back to you on that. And after a few hours, they called back and said, all right, let's do it. We will get on the phone with Roger Corman and make arrangements. So Universal calls Roger Corman and says, hey, can we use your title? And Roger Corman's like, 
well, that movie's from 1954. It never made much money. No one ever really cared about it. I would be very happy to sell you the rights to those titles. You're Universal. You're a huge company. You have a lot of money. What can you give me? And Universal said, what if we gave you the use of some of our stock footage archive? And he said, well, it's more than anyone else is paying. All right, I'll take it. <laughs> but what if I want to make 49 years later The Fast and the Furious 2? So I'm keeping the rights to numerical sequels. <laughs> You can have the Fast and the Furious, but if you ever make a sequel, you're going to have to come up with your own names. And that brings us here. <laughs> so, Universal goes on to make $7 billion dollars in gross like, box office takings from the combined entire Fast and the Furious, sorry, the Fast and the Furious franchise. Roger Corman received some stock footage, which as far as I'm aware, he has never used for anything. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Peter, Peter Hall, Tokyo Drift, everyone. Get off the stage. Right, that is the end of the lightning talks. Thank you to the AV people for making us all look great again. Thank you to Russell for waving his laptop at people and encouraging applause. <laughs> Thanks, thank you to today's elf and occasional interpretive dancer, Benno. <laughs> to the voice of Bob, uh, sadly demiked, Libby Berry. No, no. And of course, thank you to each and every one of our 13 speakers. If you and If you enjoyed today's lightning talks, you can't submit any tomorrow because there are no lightning talks. But maybe there will be a PyCon AU next year and you can submit a lightning talk then. And until then, see you later and please give a rapturous round of applause to uh, Daisy and Nick.